And uh, turn to the book of Ecclesiastes chapter 4. This is a series that I did uh, some weeks ago. This is part two. Last week, if you were here, last week, if you were here, guess what happened? We didn't get to the teaching. We had a blowout, so we didn't teach. Amos 3.3 3 says, can two walk together unless they be what, everybody? Agreed. You've got to be going the same direction in order to accomplish anything great. Today I was reading in devotions, in my devotions, in my Bible online. Uh, I'm on the U version. I read the Old and the New Testament together. So in today's version, I read out of 2 Chronicles 20. It's the whole story about Jehoshaphat. Remember King Jehoshaphat? How God used him mightily. They defeated the Malachites. They destroyed them. God did. In fact, they didn't do anything but put the worshipers and the singers out front. That's why praise and worship is so important to your victory. Okay? It's huge. So they had a great, great triumph. But it got to the end of his life and he made a boo-boo. Anybody ever made a boo-boo? The king of Israel. Now, we've got to understand something. Jehoshaphat was a good king. The king of Judah. It was the divided kingdom. And at that time, I can't remember who it was, I think it was Ahaz, or Ahaziah was the king of Israel. Ahaziah came to the king of Judah and says, listen, I have a problem. I want you to go help me defeat these people. Or, no, that's not right, that's not right, miscorrection. He says, I have some ships that I want to build. I want to go bring cargo and make some money. How many of you know there's nothing wrong with making money? There's nothing wrong with being in business? How many of you know we're all for that? We want to make money. Why? Because the kingdom operates with money. There's nothing wrong with money. It's what you do with money and how you view money. So it says, we want to go make some ships, send them to another country, bring back goods and, pro, uh, goods and services, and we'll sell them, make money. So what happens is Jehoshaphat says to Ahaziah, he says, okay, I says, we're as one then, let's hook together, we'll alliance. In fact, the word that's used there is we, they made an alliance. I mean, you know, you need to be careful who you're making alliances with. I'm talking about everything down the line. The Bible says, even to those that are potential mates getting married, it says, do not be unequally yoked. Why? Because you're destined for trouble if you're unequally yoked. Now, people always understand that in terms of, well, shouldn't be a married, an unbeliever with a, with a believer. That's true. But I take it even further than that. I mean, you better be going the same way spiritually, in the same camp spiritually, if you will. Because you can have one person that is dragging their heels, wants absolutely nothing to do with the Spirit of God, and somebody else wants the full flow of the Spirit of God. That is causing problems in the home. You bring kids into that environment, and it just exponentially begins to spread out and affect them adversely as well. So when you're looking for a potential mate, you want somebody that is going the same direction as you're going. Thank God that God gave me a wife almost 34 years ago, it'll be 34, September 1, that we were headed the same direction, called into ministry, called to fulfill the purposes of God, had the same heart and passion, excitement and enthusiasm. She's not lagging way back here, I'm not lagging way back here, but we are together hungry, thirsty, and passionate for the things of God, championing the cause of Jesus Christ. You cannot ask for a better mate than that. That's, men, what you're looking for as you're looking for a woman. Woman, that's what you're looking for in a man, that you're sharing those values. I don't care if it's in business. I don't care whatever enterprise it is. You need to be going the same direction. Do I hear an amen? amen. Okay, Ecclesiastes now, chapter 4, beginning at verse number 9. It's our foundational text. It says, two are better than one. Why? Because they have a good return for their labor. You produce more because of that. If either of them falls down, one can help the other up. But pity anyone who falls and has no one to help them up. Also, if two lie down together, they will keep warm. Sometimes too warm. But how can one keep warm alone? I run hot, Helen runs cold. But now it seems like we've shifted somewhere along the line. We both run hot. She goes, and you heard me say this a couple weeks ago. She gets close to me and she goes, oh, you're too hot, you're too hot, get away. Or she'll come over and says, oh, I'm all clammy and sweaty and I'm getting too hot, so I've got to move away. Verse 12. Though one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves. A cord of three, everybody say three. three. Strands is not quickly broken. It's intertwined. It's hard to break it because of the interconnection. Honey, I want you to come. You're going to help me with my introduction this morning. A couple of weeks ago, well, actually, I guess it was a week ago, I talked to her about her, uh, I need another mic right here. Uh, I talked to her about her upbringing as a child. She grew up in Spokane, Washington. I grew up in Rapid City, South Dakota. I was saved at five. She was saved at six. I was water baptized at seven. I was baptized in the Holy Spirit Youth Camp when I was 12 years of age. So I grew up in the church. If you were here Wednesday, I told you my story. My parents were not believers. 
They were first generation, basically, out of both their families that came to faith in Christ. God rocked their world, changed their life. I was raised in the church, they were not. So, I want you to tell a little bit about your history as you were growing up in Spokane and your desire to serve in the church. Go ahead. Oh, in the church. Um, well, I got born again, uh, like you said, when I was six at a vacation Bible school. And um, I remember that distinctly. I can still uh, basically see about everything that was there that night. And so indelibly printed on my uh, brain. But I always had, from that time, uh, actually at the same time I was called into ministry. Now, I didn't know what that meant as a girl, even though our pastor's wife was a minister. Um, I thought that was kind of all there was, and so uh, I just said, okay, whatever you want, Lord. And I kind of have, um, actually, I can honestly say I've said that my whole life, uh, Lord, whatever you want. And so, um, anyway, I just started getting involved as soon as I could. I actually started playing the piano when I was, a, <laughs> is this what you want me to yep, tell? Oh. Going right. Uh, <laughs> I started playing piano as a little kid. I wasn't uh, all that great at it. But anyway, they needed somebody in our children's church to play for, for their worship time of worship. And so we got some kids, uh, uh, not hymnals, but little books, books with the songs in it that had the chords in it. And so I'd go down there and do that. I sang in the choir. Anything, I worked in the nursery, anything and everything that I could do in the church. I did, and I loved it. I mean, I absolutely loved it. Now, maybe it wasn't all pure motive because I just wanted to be there all the time. I wanted to be involved all the time. I wanted to be around people all the time, and I wanted all of that kind of came together. But uh, I worked in the uh, nursery. I know I worked in the preschool. I know I worked in children's church. You name it, I worked in, in that area. We used to, um, our youth group, um, uh, we used to go out every summer, probably starting when I was 13 years old, and we would go for two to three weeks. We would put together a, t a team and music and that kind of thing, and we'd go out and we'd go to churches, sometimes California dir directions, sometimes toward the Midwest, but we'd do that, and we always had to either have a part in it or, or some way, and, and so we wouldn't know, but uh, our youth director would say, Okay, Helen, tonight in the service, you're gonna, I want you to give your testimony. Or uh, the next night would come, okay, Helen, tonight in the service, I want you to share a scripture and what it means and how God's working in your life. Or, or Helen, I want you to do this. And he did that with everyone on the team. So uh, you didn't know what you were doing from night to night, from day to day. And it really stretched us. We worked in children's church. We worked in everything. So by the time I actually came to college, I think I've worked in every aspect of the church without being the pastor. You know what I mean? Does that make any sense? Uh, we used to have in our youth group, we actually divided our youth group into four groups. <clears throat> we ha For a while when I was in youth, we had trouble keeping a youth pastor. Not because we were bad, but they just went to do different things. We had the same youth pastor probably from junior high till probably my uh, freshman year of high school. So three years, we probably had the same one. And then after that, every year it changed. And so we did all kinds of experiments. So one was we split the youth group up into four groups. One night a month, we would go with the uh, young couple, young married couple who was in charge of our group. And we would go to their house and we would plan a service. So every, so every um, four weeks, one different part of the youth group did the youth service. And so we did all, we did all kinds of things, uh, but our youth group just kept growing. And um, I just had a good time. I love being in the presence of the Lord. Uh, Sunday nights were, you know, everybody gets saved again night if you weren't. <laughs> and uh, the, uh, it was different than it is now, but the presence of the Lord is just so good. It doesn't matter how he moves. There was a time, there's a time and season for what, God was doing then, but there's a time and season right. for what he's doing right yep. now. And I don't ever want to get hardened to what the Lord's doing. I don't want to ever say, well, why isn't it like that? I don't even care as yeah. long as the presence of the Lord is here. I don't That's care right. what it looks like anymore. I'm tired of that kind of stuff. I just want God's presence however Amen. he wants to come. And uh, I remember um, uh, I wanted to, I, I believe I have a teaching gift yep, on me. And uh, 
when I was a senior in high school, our junior high girls could not get a uh, Sunday school teacher for the life of us. <laughs> and we have a lot of people in our church in the, in the one I grew up in. And my dad was the Sunday school superintendent. And I begged him and begged him and begged him, can I please teach this class? Can I please teach this class? Can I please teach this class? And he kept saying, no, 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 no. And finally, he really, really was desperate. <laughs> he said, OK, I will ask the pastor if he OKs it. I will let you do that. And so that was probably the last thing that I did in my home church before I came to college. And so then uh, we got together. We weren't married yet, but I think we began teaching third and fourth graders uh, uh, at Lighthouse. And then we began uh, with junior high. We, we were junior high pastors. Then we were college pastors. Then we were sent out from the church to uh, go to churches that needed a pastor or a pastor was on vacation, but they were too small. They couldn't afford somebody to come in and fill in and that kind of thing, or they didn't have anybody who could do that. So we'd go out and we'd do that. And so we just had a fun time with the, with the Lord and the Holy Spirit. And there's been ups and there's been downs. There's been good and there's been bad. But I can tell you this, God always, 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 if you think it's bad, he w as long as you keep your heart pure and, and right before him, he will turn it around for your good. Amen. Praise the Lord. Thank you. We were in our church there in Roseburg, and I said, Helen, I need you to bring some teaching. She, you know, she had taught, I think the last time, like she said, in June, what was a high school or something like that. So I just said, you need to start teaching. I wanted her to push her out there and uh, have her start teaching adults. And so she started ministering and just took off, and she has a wonderful teaching gift, and appreciate that. Prophetic edge on her as well, and so we praise the Lord for that. I want to talk about partners of service. You've probably seen the overhead behind me. As we're talking about this, I want to give you two definitions. First, the word is servant is found in Romans 16, 15 through 23. It's the word doulos in the Greek. It means the word servants is from a Greek word that is a derivation in a word which means to bind. Okay? Thus, the word in Romans refers to one who is bound to another, a slave. We were born into slavery to Satan by our first birth. How many of you know when you're born into sin? The Bible says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Is that right? Everybody. So what happens is, is that we're born by our second birth into slavery to Jesus Christ, into a glorious, free, blessed condition, which we are His loving bond slaves forever. The word also refers to a slave who is devoted to the interests of his master. Note this, to the extent that he disregards his own interests. The Lord's interests supersede and dominate our very own. That is the mark of a true doulos. Okay? You've all heard the story that when the Dulos slave would happen is they would oftentimes at the end of seven years, because the Jew was only allowed to keep a slave for seven years, at the end of that time they were, to be go they were to be set free. If they chose not to, allowed and desired their master to retain them, they would literally take their ear, they would take it to a doorpost, they would all and punch a hole through it with a hammer and they would earring into that ear, I don't know which one, you know, earrings ring different things on different ears, but anyway, they, they would put that earring in there, and it says, I am set apart to this person for the rest of my life. I am a bond slave by choice to that person. That's what happened when you and I came to faith in Jesus Christ. Next word is the word servant. It's diakonos. It's taken from Romans 16, 10. It's the same word that's used for deacon in Acts 6, and we'll get to that later. But it means this, a servant, a minister, a person who renders service and help to others. In some context with an implication of lower status, also transliterated as deacon, a trusted officer of helps and service in the local church. If there's two gifts that are needed more than probably any other gift, it's the gift of helps and the gift of service. More people probably have those gifts than any other. Okay? Now, I want you to know you can eagerly desire spiritual gifts. You're not limited. Are you hearing me? God wants to use you as you begin to be faithful in the little, you'll be faithful in the much. So let's develop this quickly. In the time that we have together, we're going to be like a speed racer today. So get your notes, get ready to rock and roll. We're going to have a fun time. Number one, the first thing that we're talking about. So let me put this in context over the next three weeks. Well, we'll see how because I won't be next week. So I did the first one. We didn't teach last week. I'm teaching today, and then I'll do the follow-up one uh, the following week after, after Elizabeth, all right? So what I'm talking about is what I am looking for for those that are here a part of Word and Spirit International Church. God is building something. I said God is building something. We get to be a part of it. And there are three things that I'm looking for in partners that will partner with us to accomplish God's purposes. But it takes you being willing to walk in lockstep in agreement. Okay? Agreement is huge. Now, to agree doesn't mean unanimity. 
Unity means we're going to get along. We're going to agree. Unanimity doesn't mean you have to believe absolutely everything exactly the way I believe it. Are you okay, okay with that? Okay. But there's a harmony that comes that we're uh, together on. So the, what I'm looking for in terms of partners of service, those that will serve in this, this house, number one, they must be available. And I think I may just give you the scriptures. You can look them up on your own. I think I'm going to rifle through them and just kind of talk about them. But in the book of Isaiah, chapter 6, verse number 8, it's the story of the calling of Isaiah the prophet. And it's when he sees the Lord, he has a vision of the heavenly throne. It changes his world. You thought what we experienced in the glory here today was great. Wait till you have a throne room experience. You will never be the same. Never be the same. Isaiah had it. And by the way, if Isaiah had it, and if Ezekiel had it, and if John the Revelator had it, guess what? It's legal for us to have it, whether personally, individually, or in corporate body together. I believe God wants us to move into the throne zone because I tell you what, when you get into the throne zone, it changes you forever. Forever. So the first thing is that we must be available. Isaiah, at the end of this call, he said this, after recognizing in God's presence, whoa, I'm undone, I'm a man with unclean lips, I live in the midst of an unclean people. We know the seraphim went over, took tongs off the altar, touched it to, it, touched it to his lips, and he says, this is now, you're clean, and he took it away, put it back, and you know what Isaiah said? He, the Lord says, who will, who will go for us? And Isaiah said, here am I, Lord, send me. The Lord is saying to everybody, because you are available, you're saying, Lord, here here am I, send me. That's the starting point. You must be available, but what happens is you must be willing. I'm available, but I'm also willing. See, some people are available, but they're not willing. There is a difference. That's why whoever gave the word about surrender, Luann, talked about surrender. Surrender says, I'm willing. It's one thing to be available. It's another thing to be available and then also willing to go wherever he will send you. That's why Helen says, Lord, whatever you want, 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 whatever you want. That when she was a little girl teaching that Sunday school class, that one day God would take her to the church in Roseburg there and have to see that thing expand and grow. And her begin to teach there and then take her to the far flung corners of the earth and stand in mainline China and teach the living word of God. To go to South Africa and teach the word of God. To go to different places on the continent in New Zealand and preach the word of God on both the North Island and the South Island to the glory of God. Why? Because God deposited something in embryonic seed form and he's doing the same thing when and you answer the call and you say, yes, Lord, I'm willing, send me like Isaiah. Now listen, it may simply be across the street, but you got to start there. Not everybody's called to the far flung corners of the earth, but some of you sitting here are today. Some of you, it begins simply going across the street. Some of you are sitting in the break room and telling somebody about Jesus. You've got to be willing to start where you are. That you're saying, Lord, I'm willing, I'm willing. Come on, you know my story. When I heard in vacation Bible school, I was already saved by then. I got saved in Sunday school. Right now in children's church, those kids right back there, there's powerful things taking place, being instilled in their life. Listen to me. The age right now, the most kids are born again right now, from the age of 5 to 14. You think we ought to invest in them? Amen. It's not just about what happens out here. It happens all the way from the nursery to the kids' ministry, all along the line. We need servants to serve. So he says, Lord, I'm available. Helen says, Lord, I, I want to do the nursery. I want to do children's church. I want to play the piano. I want to do it all. It all begins with a seed and starting where you are. So we see that, first of all, Isaiah was available. He says, Lord, here am I. Send me. So you must be willing. How many of you know in Jonah chapter 1, verses 1 through 3, Jonah wasn't willing? He was called to be a prophet of God. God says, Jonah, listen, I want you to go down to Nineveh. I want you to teach. That place is a deplorable, deplorable condition. You know, what, no, you know what Jonah did? No. He wasn't like Isaiah. He said, I ain't going there. He went the polar opposite. He headed to the coast to Joppa. Nineveh was this way. He went down to the south and to the coast, over to the west. He got on a boat. He says, I want to get out of here, Jack. I want to, you know, I want to, I, I don't want to, what is that? Uh, don't you come back, Jack? Don't you something like stand? <laughs> No more, huh? Hit the road, Jack. Don't come back no more, no more. Hit the road, Jack. Yeah, okay, you know the song. So that's Jonah, man. He's bugging out. He's in the boat, headed out into the Mediterranean. He gets out there, and listen, God loves you too much to not fulfill your destiny. So he allows this wind to whip up. 
And it's a bad one. These guys are all fishermen. They're all, they're all, they know what's going on in the boat. And they're out there and says, man, what's going on? Who, who ticked their God off? And so you know what Jonah does? He goes even deeper. He goes down below. He thinks if he can just hide out down below that he can escape. I tell you what, God's everywhere. That's why in Psalms 139, when David the psalmist says, Lord, if I go up to the highest heavens, you're there. If I go down to the lowest of Sheol, you're there. There's no place that I can hide from your presence. You can't run from God. Why would you want to? Because living life with him is the greatest greatest experience you will ever know. It's what you've been destined for. It's why you're breathing. It's why you're alive on planet Earth. And we must distinguish between market ministry and membership ministry in the house. God wants you to have both. Not everybody's called the five-fold ministry like Helen and I are. Some of you are, and we want to raise that up and elevate that. But there are others that are called to marketplace ministry. What you're doing is a job. That is your ministry place, and then you have a membership ministry in the house God has planted you. We're talking about serving. Everyone is a minister. Look at somebody and say, hey, minister. Hey. Look at somebody else and say, hey, minister. Hey. You're all called to serve. You're doulosis. You are diakonos. You're called to serve. Jonah wasn't willing. You know the whole story. He got, they, they finally had to throw him overboard, man. He gets down there, and the Lord allows a big fish to come swallow him. And this is before Moby Dick and all that. He gets down there. He gets swallowed. And then after three days, in the guts of the belly of the fish, he gets belched up. I don't know how to put it any nicer. He gets barfed up on the beach. And i got to tell you, after three days, he could not look pretty. He probably was salty. He was probably bleached white. He probably had seaweed all over him. But how do you know, at that point, he decided, man, I better go do what God's asked me to do. <laughs> I don't want any more of this running. He quit running, got right with God. He headed to Nineveh. You all know the story. He gets there. Here's his message. Man, he wasn't even into it. No passion. It's like he put a sandwich board on it. You ever see these guys with the sandwich boards? You know, they get about zero results. And everybody thinks they're goofy. But anyway, needless to say, he puts on the sandwich board. He's walking around. 40 more days and Nineveh will be destroyed. 40 more days, that's his message. 40 more days, then it'll be destroyed. 40 more, he's walking around, 40 more, three days. It's a town of 120,000. Three days to walk through the town saying that. An amazing thing. From the king, because of the city-state, to the least, to even the animals. They all went into fasting with sackcloth and ashes. They got right with God. Do not despise the preaching of the word. Why is that? And I don't care if it's in your mouth or my mouth. Because there's something about the fact that the Bible says it's through the foolishness of the preaching of the gospel that men and women get born again. I don't care if you stand on your head for 20 minutes. I don't care if you do backflips. I don't care if you have every trick under the sun. The Bible at some point has to come out of your mouth because it causes faith to rise. And what happens is it's through the foolishness of the preaching of the gospel that people get saved. And you know what? I'm not just talking about standing up here preaching like I'm preaching. I'm talking about sitting across the table from somebody, having a cup of Starbucks or whatever your favorite little organic drink is or your favorite tea is or, you know, whatever it is that you drink. And you're sitting there and you're sharing faith in Christ with them. What happens is you are preaching because declaring the wonderful words of God and they can get their hearts pricked and get born again or like me in the backyard after VBS. You thought I forgot the story, didn't you? And what happens is seven years old, I'm telling kids about Jesus and I'm saying, close your head. Oh uh, no, close your head. Close your eyes. <laughs> Bow your head. Close your eyes. Who wants to receive Jesus? I'm doing the Billy Graham thing in the backyard. I'm telling you, I'm doing that. We're having revival meetings in the backyard when I'm 10, 12, 13, 14. The power of God's coming down. People are getting baptized in the Holy Ghost. That's what I'm talking about. You don't have to wait to have a pulpit to preach. You've been sent. Say, I'm a sent one. You are apostolic people sent under the anointing of the Spirit of God. And you're serving when you do that. Jonah wasn't willing. I hope you're willing. The whole town turned up, got saved, changed it. And then he got ticked off about it. What a baby. Available. See, but it's also taking work. you got to work. How about the returning exiles in Nehemiah chapter 4, verse 6 specifically? You all know the story. They'd been in exile. Well, if you don't know the story, I'm going to tell you the story. They went to Babylon because of their backsliding. Apostasy causing their backslide. They're in Babylon. Cyrus decrees, according to Isaiah the prophet, who said they would come back. Seventy years they'd come back. They came back. First they rebuilt the temple. Then they rebuilt the walls around it. The city was left in ruins. Nehemiah comes. He's the cupbearer to the king. He has favor. How many of you know we need favor? All of you in marketplace ministry, I pray and release favor on you. Favor in your jobs, in your employment. Be the best employee that your employer has. Favor on you. Nehemiah had the ear of the king because of the favor of God on his life. 
So he goes back because God put it in his heart, burdens his heart back because the, the whole place is in disrepair. So he goes back, he inspects it, he goes out by night, goes through the gate, he rides the horse, dismounts, get out, walk through, checking it all out. He sees all the repair. He comes back, he says, all right, here's what God's asked us to do. So he begins to give out, he gives out instructions. You take this gate. So he says, okay, the, uh, Jim and Don, you guys, the Hallbrooks, this is your section. He says, okay, uh, he, he says to you guys, you, you guys, here is your section. This is this section, okay? Joe, he says, your section. Sharon, your section. On and on down the line. Are you with me? Huh? Here's your section. So, thank you. I told you I was going to be, so hang on to your hats. <laughs> hang on to your hats. <laughs> Tim and Lakina. Ian and Elizabeth. Mike and Karen. Says, here is your segment. No one left out. Jill, here's your segment. Are you hearing me? Yeah. Vernon Sherry didn't forget you. I could hear him laughing. Did you hear him laughing over here? He says, oh, man, this is my fishing buddy. You know how many hours we put on the river together? And she makes tuna fish sandwiches for me back when I could eat tuna fish with all the good stuff in it. All right, I got to hurry because I will never be done with this. So what happens is they have an assignment. This is your section, section, section. They went to work. This is, as they went to work, guess what? Two rat heads come up and rose up against them. Two guys that were a bunch of no good ne'er-withals came in and began to speak e ugly and evil of them. Sambalat and Tobio. In fact, Sambalat says, you know what? If a, if a fox jumps up on that wall, it's going to tear it down. You know how God starts developing people's lives? And you always have these people that come around and start, nah, 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 nah. Who do you think you are? Blah, blah. And it may not be them. It may be just the enemy. Or maybe the enemy working through them. You need to just steel yourself against that. And you do what you see happening with these ne people in Nehemiah. The Israelites, what they ended up doing. It says in verse 6, it says, uh, uh, verse 6 of chapter 4, it says, They had a mind to work. I don't care what you think. The Bible says do not despise the day of small beginnings when you start out in a 4,000 uh, seat joint and the kids are packed in there and the nursery's packed in here and we're packed in here. Do not despise. Stay with the goods. Guess what? Because there's coming a day, whether it's there or somewhere, we're going to go beyond. We're going we're gonna to begin to boggle the mind because of God's anointing and God's purpose for this house. Do I hear an amen? There must be a mind to work. You've got to be available. It says, Lord, I'm willing, but I also want to work. That means you've got to get your hands dirty. That means you've got to be willing. So, pastor, where do you need me? Hey, go set up a chair. Oh, well, I'm not gifted for that. I'm anointed, to, I'm anointed to stand up here and teach. Get out of here. Go wash the toilet. Oh, no, I couldn't do that. I couldn't get my hands dirty doing that. Hey, listen, I wash toilets. I remember call the ministry. We were first married. We weren't making it. We had to do something different. So we ended up going to work. We weren't making the bills. The bills weren't being made. She was in school. I was in school, college. Then I went out to work, and she went and finished, and I was still working. I got a job in a mortuary. We lived above it. Our room was taken care of. Didn't pay any rent. Didn't take care of any I didn't have to pay for the phone except for long distance. Uh, I got paid to go out and wash cars and clean the bathrooms, spray the windows. Oh, thou man of God, you've made it all the way to here as I would scrub the toilets. You see, it was on my destiny. It was on my journey to get where I was going. God provided, and it was awesome. We got completely out of debt after four years in finished college to the glory of God. We're on staff at Lighthouse at that time, all those things. Of course, we went and got in debt down in Roseburg because they, they didn't have any people, so we had to pay our way down there. But anyway, it changed. God's good. <laughs> Willing and work. Number two, point number two, you're teachable. Go to 2 Timothy chapter 2. Paul the Apostle, how many of you know he is like the uh, quintessential main apostle in the Bible? He mentored many people. You know he always moved in apostolic teams. He never did stuff alone. He always took people with him. You knew that, right? If you didn't, you do now. Heard a word about mentorship earlier. As Ian was praying, that's part of that mentoring mentorship. It's raising up those around you. It says in verse, somebody needs to answer that phone. Let me see it. Let's see it. Let me have it. Let me have it. Hurry, quick, quick, quick. Turn it up. Hi, this is Pastor John. How are you doing today? This is Pastor John. Who's this? Yeah, and who are you, ma'am? Really? What's your name? 
Part of me, say it again. Emma, I want you to know God loves you, has a wonderful plan for your life, and we're so glad that you called today all the way from Scotland. She says, thank you. We're here in church today, and all of these people just shouted and clapped their hands for you. Did you know that? Hello, are you still there? Are you still breathing, Emma? Hey, we think your dad's pretty awesome. <laughs> and, and you want to know what else? Because you're his daughter, you're awesome too. You've been created in the image of God, and God has great things in store for you. I just want to bless you today. Is that all right? Can, let me pray with you. Father, we pray for Emma. Thank you for her. It's not by accident. She called in the middle of service. Lord, I pray blessing on her today. Lord, I pray that she would begin to rise to the purpose and destiny you've ordained for her life. Bless her in all that she does. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to give you to your dad now. Is that all right? I stole the phone, I stole the phone away from That's how I got it, Emma. Probably need a... Ian, don't do that. You go call her back right now. Is she here? Is she in Scotland? Yeah. I thought so. <laughs> Where are we at? She's <laughs> Go talk to her. You talk to her. <laughs> hey, listen, you bring a phone in here and it goes off. It's fair game. <laughs> All right. Teachable, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. I will read this. You then, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Jesus Christ or Christ Jesus. And the things you have heard me say in the presence of many witnesses. Note this, entrust to who? Reliable people who will also be qualified to teach others. So we have to be teachable. Note the word teachable. Two things. First of all, you have to have an aptitude or an attitude. And it's the right attitude. Okay? A lot of times you can have the right aptitude but not have the right attitude. You know that employers, I'm just going to tell you from the business perspective, employees don't always care how much you know. They care much, much more how you get along with people and interact with people. Because if you have good people skills and the ability to learn things, they will teach you and train you. But people with stinking attitudes and a negative mindset, they don't want you. Now, I'm not talking to anybody here, and hopefully I'm not talking to anybody there. If you're negative, change your mindset. Change your speaking and change your work ethic and style. How many of you know nobody wants to be around that? Am I telling the truth? You also hate pulling somebody else's weight when they don't do their job. So attitude, let me give you an attitude. Numbers 13, 30, you all know the story. It starts in Numbers chapter 13. Moses says, we're going to send people in the promised land. We're going to go inherit it. I want to send some spies in. So they send the spies in. They put 12 guys from each, it says in each ancestral leader of each ancestral tribe. They pick 12 leaders from each ancestral tribe. They send them out, 12 tribes of Israel, right? They send them in the promised land. They go in the promised land. They're scoping it out. They're being and if they had binoculars, they didn't, but I'm pretending, okay? So they had these long telescopes they could see. I'm pretending all this. you got to put it in your mindset of today. So they're looking through the land. They're going through the land. They're equipped. They're ready. They're stealthy. They're like, you know, the seals. They're like the steels, Gil. They're like the, they're like the, what's the, what's the equivalent in the army? What's the bad guys in the army? The Rangers, thank you. They're the Rangers. They're all those guys, man. They're going in there. They're sneaking around. Okay, and they come back with a report. And they line up and says, man, you can't believe it. It's exactly like the Lord said. It is the land of milk and honey. Man, I, I can't believe the fruit and the produce and all that. It was, but, oh, but, the, but, watch the butts. Okay, I'm going to kick somebody in the butt. But anyway, here's the deal. But, we saw huge walled cities. And there were giants in the land. The sons of Anak were there. We were afraid of them. And we looked like grasshoppers in their eyes. In the middle of that, Caleb stands up and says, whoa, whoa, whoa. He's 40 years of age, by the way, boys and girls. These guys are all about 40 years of age. He says, wait a minute. Wait a minute. He says, we, he had a different attitude. All this negativity. He says, wait a minute. We have a different, we, we have a different attitude. He says, we are well able, according to Numbers chapter 13, 30. We can do it. 
God said we could, so let's go do it. That's why we got to remind ourselves when we feel like we can't do it. Because how many of you know you all, you all have feelings? Those are real. I'm not discounting them. I'm just saying you move above your feelings and you move into the faith realm. And you say, wait a minute. The Lord said in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 15, no, Romans chapter 8, excuse me. This is Romans chapter 8. He says, listen, neither height nor debt nor principality nor present, things present, nor things future, nor things past. He says, there's nothing that can separate us from the love of God. For we are, for we are. For we, say we are, we are. Right, now, right now, more than conquerors. More than conquerors. Come on, we are, we are. Right, now, right now, more than conquerors. More than conquerors. Listen, he says, if God be for us, who can be against us? Come on. We got to get our mindset on that. It's the attitude. Then we move into the aptitude. That's your ability. Is the, uh, Exodus 31, 1 through 11. Is it up there? Did I put it up there? Exodus. Oh, boy. Okay, you got it in your notes. Here it is. Exodus 31, 1 through 11. It's the story of when they're building, they're amassing the things for the tabernacle. It's the tabernacle of Moses. And how many of you know, when Moses goes looking for guys, he says, all right, here's what I want. Bezalel and Ahilab, there is a gifting and an anointing on you. You're a skilled craftsman. You're going to design the embroidery work and the different stuff. You guys are skilled. How many of you know God wants skilled people in, in assignments? Right. You may start out moving chairs, cleaning a toilet, serving in the nursery, watching kids. You may start out there, but that's only the beginning point. Please let me remind you, don't despise the day of small beginnings. If you're not faithful in the little, you will not be faithful in the much. Amen. Amen. There must be an aptitude then. A skill level. That's all of that Romans 12 stuff. All of that 1 Corinthians 12 stuff. It's all of that 1 Corinthians, uh, and then also in 1 Peter 4, 10 and 11 stuff. Read that on your own. So we can begin ident identifying. So it's aptitude. All right, I need to really quickly go. So number one, available. Say, I'm available. available. Say, number two, I'm teachable. I'm teachable. Number three, say, I'm reliable. I'm reliable. Now go to Luke chapter 16. Luke 16. Pick it up at verse 10 and 12. This is a parable that the Lord talks about, a shrewd manager. He gets to the end, verses 10 and uh, through 12 on this. He says, whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with what? Much. Whoever is dishonest with very little will also be dishonest with much. So if you have not been trustworthy in handling worldly wealth, who will trust you with true riches? How many know God's stuff is more important than riches of the world? I remember we were in uh, Pensacola, Florida, when the whole outpouring was going on, revival was taking place there. Helen and I were there. And there was a guy who'd greet everybody. He was the main head usher. This main head usher was a guy who was, a, he was in banking. He was over a number of banks, very important lead, critical guy in banks. And he was running the ushering stuff. You could say, well, that was beneath him. No, he understood something. He was a servant in the household. He had a, he, had a, he had a ministry in the marketplace, but he also had a membership ministry in the body of Christ. He didn't disdain it. He embraced it, and he made it fun to be there because he was good at what he did. Ushers are important. The Bible says, I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of the Lord one day than a thousand elsewhere. It's in the Psalms. How about TV operators? How about all kinds of things? How about the outreach? How about going out and ministering to people once a month minimum? Our key evangelist over here, Mr. Ian Hawker, you can't go without him talking to somebody. We had to go get him to find, so he could come home yesterday. I had to take a van and go. I called him like three times. Of course, he didn't answer my phone. But anyway... <laughs> So I'm driving down the road. Anthony stayed back, so he, if he came there, he could intercept him. I'm with the van. We're going down the streets looking for Ian. And sure enough, Ian is talking to somebody. Does anybody not know Ian to talk to somebody? Can Ian talk? It's part of his gift mix. It's that evangelist bent in him that loves people and reaches out to people. <laughs> I said, I open the door, and I'm looking at him. And he walks about. He's looking. He does a double take because he doesn't says, oh, that's you guys. He says, get over here and get in the van. <laughs> We're going home. <laughs> By the way, 100 people got saved yesterday through the ministry <laughs> and outreach. Others got healed and delivered. <sighs> All right, where am I at? Okay, you will be, so you'll deal with, you'll deal with stuff well. So you gotta, you've got to show up. You've got to be reliable. That means you've got to show up. Second Timothy, I was just there too, two a moment ago, entrust to reliable people. Reliable people. You've got to show up. 
Reliable means you're going to show up. If you say you're going to do something, do it. To a hurt, David said. If you can't, call and say, I can't for this reason. And if you can change with somebody that needs to be in your place, do that. But don't stiff the church. How many of you know God's work is really more important than your work? But you treat it, so, not you guys. Look at somebody say, he's talking about somebody else. He's not talking about me right now. <laughs> Sometimes people treat the Lord's stuff way second and worse than they would their employer. Be, like I said, be the best employee. Show up on time, do your job, all this stuff. You ought to do the same thing for the house of God, and even more so. Hello? All right, I had this guy. We went down to Roseburg. Didn't have anybody there. Y'all bailed out. Former pastor started a church the same day we went down there. Like 15 people. So we had to build from the ground up. It was a restart, basically, is what it was. We'd call it a restart. Now, you don't have those technical knowledge. Uh, it was a restart. I mean, we did everything. I was the, I was the janitor. I was the lawnmower. I was the maintenance man, the janitor. I took care of lawn care. I roofed. I mean, we did it all, didn't we, baby? God's made of faith and power. Tearing the roof off. God sees. He knows what he's doing. So, we raise up these people. Some of the first people we interact with is a couple that comes. She gets born again, praise God. I get to lead her to Christ. He gets reborn again, or gets, he, gets, uh, he rededicates his life to Christ. He has this mindset. Well, I'm going to get in a Christian band. I'm playing the guitar. I'm going to travel all over the world. Finally, I had to sit down with him as the apostolic anointing on my life and say very lovingly, Brother, you aren't going anywhere until you can get in the house of God, show up on a regular basis, and play your guitar for Jesus in this house. Now, I knew one of two things would happen. He'd say, I'm all wet and leave and never talk to me again. Or he'd say, God gripped his heart, and he'd change, and he'd do that. God gripped his heart, changed him. You know what? He was one of my most faithful, loyal, confidence our whole time there. He went through the whole in-state program, became licensed, and became a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ. But I had to tell him the truth. See, sometimes people don't want to hear the truth. We want to live in the consumer world church. And you know what? That's really a lot of sometimes the pastor's fault for creating a consumer-minded church. We're going to come. We're going to dance. We're going to sing. We're going to do this, that, and everything else. We're going to put on a great production, a great program. And I have, none of, I have no problem with dancing. I have no problem with singing specials or any of those things. Are you hearing me? But that will not win the day. It takes the anointing and the power of Christ. And it takes recruiting people and saying, listen, we need your involvement here. It's not, it's not going to be the, the 20% that do the 80%. We need all hands on deck. Everybody has a ministry. Everybody's been called to serve. Nobody's left out. See, but a consumer mindset says, we're going we're gonna to bless you and feed you and love you and stroke your neck and tell you how wonderful you are. And I want to do all that because I'm a positive person. And I want to encourage you because I want to call forth the gold. But at the same time, you have a ministry both outside and inside the body and it's incumbent upon you and me to help you find that and identify that and release it and use it are you hearing me so it means you gotta show up in order to be used all right finally act six so if i ask you go stand at the door and greet people because you have a nice smiley face and your chickens well i really don't want to do that <laughs> okay go ahead run around the mountain a few more times and it doesn't matter if it's here or somewhere. You are going to, God wants, he loves you too much to, you can't be a Jonah. Days of Jonah are over, man. It's time. The army is being built. All right, finally and lastly, Acts 6, 1. It says, in those days when the number of disciples was increasing, I like that, the Hellenistic Jews among them complained against the Hebraic Jews because their widows were be, being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. So the twelve gathered all the disciples together and said, it would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the word of God in order to wait on tables. Not that it was important, it wasn't the most important thing. Brothers and sisters, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the Spirit and wisdom. We'll turn this responsibility over to them and we'll give our attention to two things. It is the, it is the primary responsibility of fivefold ministry in the house to give themselves an attention to prayer and ministry of the word. All the other stuff that oftentimes has an expectation from people put upon pastors and leaders is not of God, it is of man. And that is, Pastor, I want you to do this. Pastor, I want you to do this. Pastor, I want you to come clip the toenails on my parrot at my house. <laughs> Seriously, Helen's pastor. He's more gracious than I am. I wouldn't have done that. That's not the pastor's job. Do you still love me? Deacons. It's the same word, servant. 
Mark 10, 35 through 45, I'm in my conclusion now, and I won't, uh, I just read this. It's my conclusion. Quoting from Dwight Pentecost, the words and works of Jesus Christ the Messiah. He says, Christ taught that if one would be great, he must attain the greatness by becoming a servant to those whom he would rule. The one who wanted to be in a position of prominence must gain it by becoming a slave. He himself was an example for that teaching. Although the Son of Man was destined by God to rule over the earth in the millennial kingdom, God's Son came into the world as a servant, not as a master. As a servant obedient to the will of his Father, he would give his life as a ransom for many. So whatever I do in the same way, or fivefold ministry leadership, we have to have a servant's heart. It's the same way. And what we do is we serve. That's why I said in Roseburg, I did what I had to do because there was no one else there. As we gathered people, we included them, included them, included them, which releases more and more for the, for the leadership to do what it needs to really be doing. Are, are you hearing me? Why you're being equipped to lay hands on the sick is so that you have to call Pastor. Pastor John, you've got to come over here right now. Ah, ah, this person has this. Uh, we've got to lay hands on him. Hey, you do it. You're empowered. You have anointing. I get a call. We're, we're in Roseburg. Same thing. Always, and you heard me say this before, always, Saturday night, midnight, 1 o'clock, I get a call. Hey, I need you to come cast the demon out of somebody. Oh, my goodness. You should be equipped to cast the demon out yourself. Amen. That's what we want to do, is equip people to do that. Smile at me real big. <laughs> Closing story, and I'm done. My mom and dad were servants. I remember we, when I was a kid, I grew up basically from when I was five to college. I left, uh, just turned 18 and came to college. We grew up in the south side of Rapid City. Between our church, which was on the north side, clear at the north side, we were at the south side. In between, there was a lady. She was a widow lady. Her name was Sister Porter. <laughs> Sister Porter was old, kind of cantankerous, <laughs> but my mom and dad would faithfully, as servants, go pick her up. My dad served. He was usher, all kinds of things in the house of God. I can tell you story after story. But I'll never forget this. We'd always go pick up Sister Porter. She'd get in the back. She'd get in the back. And sometimes she'd get in the front because she couldn't get in the back. But I remember this. She'd always hawk up a loogie. Does anybody know what a loogie is? <laughs> so she'd carry a napkin. No, this is not a good way to end it, but it's, it's, it's what I got. <laughs> she'd dredge him out of the deep. I watched this many times. <laughs> Into the napkin. Week after week. Of course, we kids, we'd have fun with that, us boys, you know. We'd <laughs> but I never forget, she'd come up to get it dropped, whether it was dropped off at her house or at the church. And before we'd get there, man, the door was flung open. We we're going to lose her, man. She was always like in this hurry to get out. And she was, she was old. So, yeah, the door would fly open. You don't have to reach over and grab her before she flies out, before the car comes to a complete stop. Please remain in the vehicle until we come to a complete stop. <laughs> you know what? No one else may have known about my mom and dad's service, but it said something to us four kids. Kingdom ministry isn't always what you think it is. It's the simple, simple, basic acts of ministering to people right where they're at. And indelibly imprinted me for life. I'm not the same because I saw it modeled before my very eyes. Folks, serve where you're at. Start and serve where you're at. Whatever you may be challenged to, now, we may need to adjust you and get you to where you really fit. But start somewhere. Amen. See, I'm available. I'm teachable. I'm reliable.